Chapter Twenty One of Ravenstein Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Chinese Gentleman. I could not repress an unconscious involuntary start on hearing this remarkable declaration. It seemed to open as widely as suddenly an entirely new field of vision. It was as if some hand had abruptly torn aside a veil and shown me something that I had never dreamed of. And Baxter laughed significantly. "'That strikes you, Middlebrook,' he said. "'Very forcibly, indeed,' said I. "'If what you say is true, I mean, if one of those two men had such valuables on him, then there's a reason for the murder of both that none of us knew. But is it probable that the Quicks would still be in possession of jewels that you saw some years ago?' "'Not so many years ago, when all's said and done,' he answered. "'And you couldn't dispose of things like those very readily, you know. "'You can take it from me, knowing what I did of them, "'that neither Noah nor Salter Quick would sell anything "'unless at its full value, or something like it. "'They weren't hard up for money, either of them. "'They could afford to wait, in the matter of a sale of anything, "'until they found somebody who would give their price. "'You say these things, rubies, I think?' were worth a lot of money i asked heaps of money he affirmed do you know anything about rubies not much well the ruby i dare say you do know is the most precious of precious stones the real true ruby the oriental one is found in greatest quantity in burma and siam and the best are those that come from mogok which is a district lying northward of mandalay these rubies that the quicks had came from there they were remarkably fine ones, and I know how and where those precious villains got them. Yes, I said, feeling that another dark story lay behind this declaration. Not honestly, I suppose. Far from it, he replied with a grim smile. Those two rubies formed the eyes of some ugly god or other in a heathen temple in Guangdong province of southern China, where the quicks carried on more nefarious practices than that. They gouged them out, according to their own story. Then, of course, they cleared off. You saw the rubies, I asked. More than once, on that island in the Yellow Sea, he answered. Noah and Salter would have bartered either or both for a ship at one period. But, he added with a sneering laugh, you may lay your life that when they boarded that Chinese fishing boat, on which they made their escape, they'd pay for their passage as meanly as possible. No, my belief is that they still had those rubies on them when they turned up in England again, and that, as likely as not, they were murdered for them. Take all the circumstances of the murder into consideration. In each case the dead man's clothing was ripped to pieces, the linings examined, even the padding of the chest and shoulder torn out and scattered about. What were the murderers seeking for? Not for money. As far as I remember, each man had a good deal of money on him, and not a penny was touched. What was it, then? My own belief is that after Salter Quick joined Noah at Devonport, both brothers were steadily watched by men who knew what they had on them, and that when Salter came north he was followed, just as Noah was tracked down at Saltash and i should say that whoever murdered them got the rubies they may have been on noah they may have been on salter one may have been in salter's possession one in noah's but there in the rubies lies in my belief the secret of these murders i felt that here in this lonely cove we were probably much nearer the solution of the mystery that had baffled scarterfield ourselves the police and everybody that we knew and so apparently did Miss Raven, who suddenly turned on Baxter with a look that was half an appeal. Mr. Baxter, she said, colouring a little at her own temerity, why don't you follow Mr. Middlebrook's advice? Give up the old silver and the rest of it to the authorities, and help them to track down those murderers. Wouldn't that be better than whatever it is you're doing? But Baxter laughed, flung away his cigar, and rose to his feet. "'A deal better, from many standpoints, my dear young lady,' he exclaimed. "'But too late for Netherfield Baxter. "'He's an Ishmael, a pirate, a highwayman, "'and it's too late for him to do anything but gang his own gate. 
No, I'm not going to help the police, not I. I've enough to do to keep out of their way. You'll get caught, you know, I said, as good-humouredly as possible. You'll never get this stuff that's upstairs across the Atlantic and into New York or Boston or any Yankee port without detection. As you were treating us well, your secret's safe enough with us, but think, man, of the difficulties of taking your loot across an ocean, to say nothing of customs officers on the other side. I never said we were going to take it across the Atlantic, he answered coolly, and with another of his cynical laughs. I said we were going to sail this bit of a craft across there, so we are. But when we strike New York, or New Orleans, or Pernambuco, or Buenos Aires, Middlebrook, the stuff won't be there. The stuff, my lad, won't leave British waters. Deep, deep is your queer acquaintance, Netherfield Baxter, and if he does run risks now and then, he always provides for them. Evidently you intend to transship your precious cargo, I suggested. The door of its market is yawning for it, Middlebrook, and not far away, he answered. If this craft drops in at Aberdeen, or at Thurso, or at Moville, and the customs folks, or any other such-like hawks and kites, come aboard, they'll find nothing but three innocent gentlemen and their servants a-yachting it across the free seas. Verbum sapienti, Middlebrook, as we said in my Latin days, far off now. But wouldn't Miss Raven like to retire? It's late. I'll send Chu with hot water. If you want anything, Middlebrook, command him. As for me, I shan't see you again to-night. I must keep a watch for my pal coming aboard from his little mission ashore. Then with curt politeness he bade us both good-night, and went off on deck, and we two captives looked at each other. Strange man, murmured Miss Raven. She gave me a direct glance that had a lot of meaning in it. Mr. Middlebrook, she went on, in a still lower voice, let me tell you that I'm not afraid. I'm sure that man means no personal harm to us. But is there anything you want to say to me before I go? Only this, I answered. Do you sleep very soundly? Not so soundly that I shouldn't hear if you called me, she replied. I'm going to mount guard here, I said. I, too, believe in what Baxter says. But if I should for any reason have occasion to call you during the night, do at once precisely what I tell you to do. Of course, she said. The Chinaman, who had been in evidence at intervals since our arrival, came into the little saloon with a can of hot water, and disappeared into the inner cabin which had been given up to Miss Raven. She softly said good night to me, with the reassurance of her confidence that all would be well, and followed him. I heard her talking to this strange makeshift for a maid for a moment or two. Then the man came out, grinning as if well pleased with himself, and she closed and fastened the door on him. The Chinaman turned to me, asking in a soft voice if there was anything I pleased to need. "'Nothing but the rugs and pillows that your master spoke of,' I answered. He opened a locker on the floor of the place, and producing a number of cushions and blankets from it, made me up a very tolerable couch. Then, with a polite bow, he too departed, and I was left alone. Of one thing I was firmly determined. I was not going to allow myself to sleep. I firmly believed in Baxter's good intentions, in spite of his record strange and shady by his own admission. There was something in him that won confidence. He was unprincipled, without doubt, and the sort of man who would be all the worse if resisted, being evidently naturally wayward, headstrong, and foolishly obstinate. But like all bad men, he had good points, and one of his seemed to be a certain pride in showing people like ourselves that he could behave himself like a gentleman. That pride, a species of vanity, of course, would, I felt sure, make him keep his word to us, and especially to Miss Raven. But he was only one amongst a crowd. For anything I knew, his French friend might be as consummate a villain as ever walked, and the Chinese in the galley cut throats of the best quality. And there, behind a mere partition, was a helpless girl, and I was unarmed. 
It was a highly serious and unpleasant situation at the best of it, and the only thing I could do was to keep awake and remain on the alert until morning came. I took off coat and waistcoat, folded a blanket shawl-wise around my shoulders, wrapped another round my legs, and made myself fairly comfortable in the cushions which the Chinaman had deftly arranged in an angle of the cabin. I had directed him to settle my night's quarters in a corner close to Miss Raven's door, and immediately facing the half-dozen steps which led upwards to the deck. At the head of those steps was a door. I had bade him leave it open, so that I might have plenty of air. When he had gone, I had extinguished the lamp which swung from the roof. And now, half sitting, half lying, amongst my cushions and rugs, I faced the patch of sky framed in that open doorway, and saw that the night was a clear one, and that the heavens were full of glittering stars. I had just refilled and lighted my pipe, before settling down to my vigils, and for a long time I lay there, smoking and thinking. My thoughts were somewhat confused, confused at any rate to the extent that they ranged over a variety of subjects, our apprehension that afternoon, the queer, almost if not wholly, eccentric character of Netherfield Baxter, his strange story of the events in the Yellow Sea, his frank avowal of his share of the theft of the monastic spoils, his theory about Noah and Salter Quick, and other matters arising out of these things. The whirl of it all in my anxious brain made me more than once feel disposed to sleep. I realized that in spite of everything, I should sleep unless I kept up a stern determination to remain awake. Everything on board that strange craft was as still as the skies above her decks. I heard no sound whatever, save a very gentle lapping of the water against the vessel's timbers, and occasionally the far-off hooting of owls in the woods that overhung the cove. These sounds, of course, were provocative of slumber. I had to keep smoking to prevent myself from dropping into a doze. And perhaps two hours may have gone in this fashion, and it was, I should think, a little after midnight, when I heard, at first far away towards the land, and then gradually coming nearer, the light, slow plashing of oars that gently and leisurely rose and fell. This, of course, was the Frenchman coming back from his mission to Berwick. He would, I knew, have gone there from the little wayside station that lay beyond the woods at the back of the cove, and have returned by a late train to the same place. Somehow, I could not well account for it, the mere fact of his coming back made me nervous and uneasy. I was not so certain about his innocence in the matter of Salter Quick's murder. On Baxter's own showing, the Frenchman had been hanging around that coast for some little time, just when Salter Quick descended upon it. He, like Baxter, if Baxter's story were true, was aware that one or other of the Quicks carried those valuable rubies, even if, the York episode being taken for granted, he had not killed Salter Quick himself, he might be privy to the doings of some accomplice who had. Anyway, he was a doubtful quantity, and the mere fact that he was back again on that yawl made me more resolved than ever to keep awake and preserve a sharp lookout. I heard the boat come alongside. I heard steps on the deck just outside my open door. Then Baxter's voice. Presently, too, I heard other voices. One, that of the Frenchman, which I recognized from having heard him speak in the afternoon, the other a soft, gentle, laughing voice, without doubt that of an Eastern. This, of course, would be the Chinese gentleman of whom I had heard, the man who had been seen in company with Baxter and the Frenchman at Hull. So now the three principal actors in this affair were all gathered together, separated from me and Miss Raven by a few planks, and close by were three Chinese of whose qualities I knew nothing. Safe we might be, but we were certainly on the very edge of a hornet's nest. I heard the three men talking together in low, subdued tones for a few minutes. Then they went along the deck above me, and the sound of their steps ceased. But as I lay there in the darkness, two round disks of light suddenly appeared on the mirror which hung on the boarding of the cabin immediately facing me. 
and turning my head sharply i saw that in the bulkhead behind me there were two similar holes pierced in what was probably a door which would no doubt be sunk flush with the boarding and was possibly the entrance to some other cabin that could be entered from a further part of the deck behind that under a newly lighted lamp the three men were now certainly gathered i was desperately anxious to know what they were doing anxious of course to the point of nervousness to know what they looked like taken in bulk i could hear them talking in there still in very low tones and i would have given much to hear even a few words of their conversation and after a time of miserable indecision for i was afraid of doing anything that would lead to suspicion or resentment on their part and i was by no means sure that i might not be under observation of one of those silky-footed chinese from the galley i determined to look through the holes in the door and see whatever was to be seen i got out of my wrappings in my corner so noiselessly that i don't believe any one actually present in my cabin would have heard even a rustle and tiptoeing in my stockinged feet across to the bulkhead which separated me from the three men put an eye to one of the holes to my great joy i then found that i could see into the place to which baxter and his companions had retreated it was a sort of cabin rougher in accommodation than that in which i stood fitted with bunks on three sides and furnished with a table in the centre over which swung a lamp the three men stood round this table examining some papers the lamplight fell full on all three baxter stood there in his shirt and trousers the frenchman also was half dressed as if preparing for rest but the third man was still as he had come aboard a little yellow-faced dapper sleek chinaman whose smart velvet-collared overcoat thrown open revealed an equally smart dark tweed suit beneath it and an elegant gold watch-chain festooned across the waistcoat he was smoking a cigar just lighted that it was of a fine brand i could tell by the aroma that floated to me and on the table before the three stood a whisky bottle a siphon of mineral water and glasses which had evidently just been filled baxter and the frenchman stood elbow to elbow the frenchman held in his hands a number of sheets of paper foolscap size to the contents of which he was obviously drawing baxter's attention presently they turned to a desk which stood in one corner of the place and baxter lifting its lid produced a big ledger-like book over which they bent evidently comparing certain entries in it with the papers in the frenchman's hand what book or papers might be i of course knew nothing for all this was done in silence but had i known anything or heard anything it would have seemed of no significance compared with what i just then saw a thing that suddenly turned me almost sick with a nameless fear and set me trembling from toe to finger the dapper and smug chinaman statuesque on one side of the table immovable save for an occasional puff of his cigar suddenly shot into silent activity as the two men turned their backs on him and bent apparently absorbed over the desk in the corner like a flash it reminded me of the lightning-like movement of a viper his long thin fingers went into a waistcoat pocket like a flash emerged shot to the glasses on the table and into two of them dropped something small and white some tabloid or pellet that sank and dissolved as rapidly as it was put in it was all over all done within literally the fraction of a second when a moment or two later baxter and the frenchman turned round again after throwing the ledger-like book and the papers into the desk their companion was placidly smoking his cigar and sipping the contents of his glass between the whiffs i was by that time desperately careless as to whether i might or might not be under observation from the open door and the stairway of my own cabin i remained where i was my eye glued to that ventilation hole watching for it seemed to me that the chinaman was purposely drugging his companions for some insidious purpose of his own in that case what of the personal safety of miss raven and myself 
For one moment I was half-minded to rush round to the other cabin and tell Baxter of what I had just seen, but I reflected that I might possibly bring about there and then an affair of bloodshed and perhaps murder, in which there would be four Chinese against three others, one of whom, my miserable self, was not only unarmed, but like enough to be useless in a scene of violence. No, the only thing was to wait, and wait I did, with a thumping heart and a tingling nerves watching. Nothing happened. Baxter gulped down his drink in a single draught. The French took his in two leisurely swallows. Each flung himself on his bunk, pulled his blankets about him, and as far as I could see seemed to fall asleep instantly. But the Chinaman was more deliberate and punctilious. He took his time over his cigar and his whiskey. He pulled out a suitcase from some nook or other and produced from it a truly gorgeous sleeping suit of gaily striped silk. It occupied him quite twenty minutes to get undressed and into this grandeur, and even then he lingered, fiddling about in carefully folding and arranging his garment. In the course of this, and in moving about the narrow cabin, he took apparently casual glances at Baxter and the Frenchman and I saw from his satisfied, quiet smirk that each was sound and fast asleep. And then he thrust his feet into a pair of bedroom slippers, as loud in their colourings as his pyjamas, and suddenly turning down the lamp with a twist of his wicked-looking fingers, he glided out of the door into the darkness above it. At that I, too, glided swiftly back to my blankets. End of chapter 21 Chapter Twenty Two of Ravensdene Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Red Dawn. I heard steps, soft as snowflakes, go along the deck above me. For an instant they paused by the open door at the head of my stairway. Then they went on again, and all was silent as before. But in that silence, above the gentle lapping of the water against the side of the yawl, I heard the furious thumping of my own heart, and I did not wonder at it, nor was I then, nor am I now ashamed of the fear that made it thump. Clearly, whatever else it might mean, if Baxter and the Frenchman were, as I surely believed them to be, soundly drugged, Miss Raven and I were at the positive mercy of a pack of Chinese adventurers who would probably stick at nothing. But my problem one sufficient to rack every fibre of my brain, was, what were they after? The Chinese gentleman in the flamboyant pyjamas had without doubt repaired to his compatriots in the galley, forward. At that moment they were, of course, holding some unholy conference. Were they going to murder Baxter and the Frenchman for the sake of the swag now safely on board? It was possible. I had heard many a tale far less so. No doubt the supreme spirit was a man of subtlety and craft. So, too, most likely was our friend Lo Chu Fun. The other two would not be wanting. And if, of these other two, Wing, as Miss Raven had confidently surmised, and as I thought it possible, was one, then, indeed, there would be brains enough and to spare for the carrying out of any adventure. It seemed to me, as I lay there, quaking and sweating in sheer fright, I, a defenceless, quiet, peace-loving gentleman of bookish tastes, who scarcely knew one end of a revolver from the other, that what was likely was that the Chinese were going to round on their English and French associates, collar the loot for themselves, and sail the yawl, heaven alone knew where. But in that case, what was going to become of me and my helpless companion? It was not likely that these Easterns would treat us with the consideration which we had received from the queer, eccentric, somewhat muddle-headed Netherfield Baxter, who, it struck me with odd inconsequence at that inopportune moment, was certainly a combination of Dick Turpin, Gilles Blas, and Don Quixote. I suppose it was nearly an hour that passed. It may have been more, it may have been less. What I know is that it gave me some idea of what an accused man may feel who, waiting in a cell below, 
wonders what the foreman of a jury is going to say when he is called upstairs once more to the dock which he has vacated pending that jury's deliberations once or twice i thought of daring everything rousing miss raven and attempting an escape by means of the boat which no doubt lay at the side of the yawl but reflection suggested that so desperate a deed would only mean getting a bullet through me and perhaps through her as well then i speculated on my chances of making a sinuous way along the deck on my hands and knees or on my stomach snake fashion with the idea of listening at the hatch of the galley reflection again warned me that such an adventure would as likely as not end up with a few inches of cold steel in my side or through my gullet so there i lay sweating with fear rapidly disintegrating as to nerve power becoming a lump of moral rag and bone and suddenly unheralded by the slightest sound i saw the figure of a man on my stairway his outline silhouetted against the sky and the stars it was not because of any bravery on my part i'm sure of that but through sheer fright that before i had the least idea of what i was doing i had thrown myself clear of rugs and pillows sprung to my feet made one frenzied leap across the bit of intervening space and clutched my intruder by his arms before his softly padded feet touched the floor of the cabin my own breath was coming in gasps but the response to my frenzy was quiet and cool as an autumnal afternoon can you row a boat i shall never forget the mental douche which dashed itself over me in that clear yet scarcely perceptible whisper accompanied as it was by a ghost-like laugh of sheer amusement i released my grip staring in the starlight at my visitor lo chu fun yes i answered steadying my voice and keeping it down to as low tones as his own yes i can he pointed to the door behind which lay miss raven wake missy as quietly as possible he whispered tell her get ready come on deck make no noise all ready for you then you go ashore and away see not good for you to be here longer no danger to her i asked him no danger to anybody you do as i say he answered all ready for you nothing to do but come on deck forward get into the boat be off now without another word he glided up the stairway and disappeared for a few seconds i stood irresolute was it a trick a plant should we be safe on deck or targets for chinese bullets or receptacles for chinese knives maybe yet i suddenly made up my mind it was but one step to the door of the little inner cabin i scraped on its panels it opened instantly a crack yes whispered miss raven i remembered then that if need arose she was to do unquestioningly anything i told her to do dress at once and come out i said be quick i've never undressed she answered i lay down in my clothes then come just now i commanded wait for nothing she was out of the room at once and by my side in the gloom i laid a hand on her arm giving its plumped softness a reassuring pressure don't be afraid i whispered follow me on deck we're going going she said leaving come along said i i went before her up the stairway and out on the open deck the night was particularly clear the stars very bright the patch of water between the yawl and the shore lay before us calm and dark we could see the woods above the cove quite plainly and at the edge of them a ribbon of white the silver sanded beach and also at the forward part of the vessel we were leaving i saw or fancied i saw shadowy forms the chinese were going to see us off but one form was not shadowy nor problematical chu was there awaiting us his arms filled with rugs without a word he motioned us to follow preceded us along the side of the yawl to the boat went before us into it helped us down settled us put the oars into my hands climbed out again and leaned his yellow face down at me you pull straight ahead he murmured good landing place straight before you dry place on beach too 
Morning comes soon. You get away, then, through woods. The boat? I asked him. You leave boat there, anywhere, he answered. Boat not wanted again. We go, soon as high water over bar. Hope you get young Missy safe home. Bless you, I said under my breath. Then, remembering that I had some money in my pocket, three or four loose sovereigns, as luck would have it, I thrust a hand therein, pulled them out, forced them into the man's claw-like fingers. I heard him chuckle softly, then his head disappeared behind the rail of the yawl, and I shoved the boat off, and for the next few minutes bent to those oars, as I had certainly never bent to any previous labour, mental or physical, in my life. And Miss Raven, seeing my earnestness, said nothing, but quietly took the tiller, and steered us in a straight line for the spot which the Chinaman had indicated. Neither of us, strange as it may seem, spoke one single word, until, at the end of half an hour's steady pull, the boat's nose ran onto the shingly beach, beneath a fringe of dwarf oak that came right down to the edge of the shore. I sprang out with a feeling of thankfulness that it would be hard to describe, and for a good reason found my tongue once more. "'Great Scott!' I exclaimed. "'I've left my boots in that cabin!' Despite the strange situation in which we were still placed, Miss Raven's sense of humour asserted itself. She laughed. "'Your boots,' she said. "'Whatever will you do? These stones and the long walk home.' "'There are things to be thought of before that,' said I. "'We're still in the middle of the night. But this boat, do you think you can help me to drag it up the beach?' Between us, the boat being a light one, we managed to pull it across the pebbles and under the low cliff, beneath the overhanging fringe of the wood. In the uncertain light, for there was no moon, and since our setting out from the yawl, masses of cloud had come up from the southeast to obscure the stars, the wood looked impenetrably black. "'We shall have to wait here until the dawn comes,' I remarked. "'We can't find our way through the wood in this darkness.' I can't even recollect the path, if there was one, by which they brought us down here from the ruins. You had better sit in the boat and make yourself comfortable with those rugs. Considerate of them, at any rate, to provide us with those. She got into the boat again, and I wrapped one rug round her knees and placed another about her shoulders. And you? she asked. I must do a bit of amateur boot-making, I answered. I'm going to cut this third rug into strips and bind them about my feet. Can't walk over stones and thorns and thistles, to say nothing of the moorland track without some protection. I got out my pocket-knife, and sitting on the side of the boat began my task. For a few minutes she watched me in silence. "'What does all this mean?' she said at last suddenly. "'Why have they let us go?' "'No idea,' I answered. But things have happened since Baxter said good-night to us. Listen, and I went on to tell her of all that had taken place on the yawl since the return of the Frenchman and his Chinese companion. What does it look like? I concluded. Doesn't it seem as if the Chinese intend foul play to those two? Do you mean that they intend to... to murder them? She asked in a half-frightened whisper. Surely not that. I don't see that a man who has lived the life that Baxter has can expect anything but a violent end, I replied callously. Yes, I suppose that's what they do mean. I think the Chinese mean to get rid of the two others and get away with the swag, cleverly enough, no doubt. Horrible, she murmured. Inevitable, said I. To my mind the whole atmosphere was one of that sort of thing. We're most uncommonly lucky. She became silent again, and remained so for some time, while I went on at my task, binding the strips of rug about my feet and ankles, and fastening them, putty fashion around my legs. "'I don't understand it,' she exclaimed, after several minutes had gone by. "'Surely those men must know that we, once free of them, would be sure to give the alarm. We aren't under any promise to them, whatever we were to Baxter.' I don't understand anything, I said. All I know is the surface of the situation. But that gentle villain who saw us off the yawl said that they were sailing at high water. 
only waiting until the tide was deep on the bar outside there and they could get a long way north or south or east before we could set anybody on to them supposing they did get rid of baxter and his frenchman what's to prevent them making off across the north sea to say some port in the north of russia they've got stuff on board that would be saleable anywhere no doubt they'll have it all melted into shapeless lumps before many hours are out once more she was silent and when she spoke again it was in a note of decision no i don't think that's it at all she said emphatically they're dependent on wind and weather and the seas aren't so wide but that they'd be caught on our information i'm sure that isn't it what is it then i asked i've a sort of vague misty idea she answered with a laugh that was plainly intended to be deprecatory of her own power supposing these chinese you say they're awfully keen and astute suppose they've got a plot amongst themselves for handing baxter and the frenchman over to the police the authorities with their plunder do you see it i had just finished the manufacture of my novel footwear and i jumped to my padded feet with an exclamation that this time did not come from unpleasant contact with the sharp stones by george i said there is an idea in that there may be something in it we thought wing was on board she continued if so i think i may be right in offering such a suggestion supposing that wing came across these people when he went to london took service with them in the hope of getting at their secret suppose he's induced the other chinese to secure baxter and the frenchman that in short he's been playing the part of detective wouldn't that explain why they sent us away partly yes perhaps wholly i said struggling with this new idea but where and when and how do they intend if your theory's correct to do the handing over that's surely easy enough she replied quickly there's nothing to do but sail the yawl into say berwick harbour and call the police aboard a very very easy matter i wonder if it is so i answered musingly it might be but if we stay here until it's light and the tide's up we shall see which way the yawl goes it's high water between five and six o'clock she remarked anyway it was between four and five yesterday morning at ravensdene court which now seems to be far away in some other world hungry i asked not a bit she answered but it's a long way since yesterday afternoon we've seen things we've certainly seen mr netherfield baxter i observed a fascinating man she said with a laugh the sort of man under other circumstances one would like to have to dinner mm, said i a ready and plausible tongue to be sure i dare say there are women who would fall in love with such a man lots she answered with ready assent as i said just now he's a very fascinating person ah said i teasingly i had a suspicion last night that he was exciting your sympathetic interest i'm much more sympathetic about your lack of boots and shoes she retorted but as you seem to have rigged up some sort of satisfactory substitute don't you think we might be making our way homewards is there any need to go through the woods why should we not follow the coast i'm doubtful about our ability to get round the south point of this cove i answered i was looking at it yesterday afternoon from the deck of the yawl and i saw that just there a sort of wall of rock runs right out into the sea and if the tide's coming in that the woods she interrupted surely we can make our way through them somehow and it will begin to get light in another hour or two but it's darker in there than you think for and rougher going too however just then and before she had made up her mind we were both switched off that line of action by something that broke out on another across the three-quarters of a mile of water which separated us from our recent prison came the sound clear and unmistakable of a revolver shot followed almost instantly by another miss raven who had risen to her feet suddenly sat down again a third shot rang out a fourth a fifth we saw the flashes of each they came without doubt from the deck of the yawl 
firing she murmured fighting said i that's just listen to that half a dozen reports sharp insistent rang out in quick succession then two or three all mingling together the echoes followed from wood and cliff rapidly as the flashes pierced the gloom the sounds died out a heavy silence followed that's just what asked miss raven calmly well if not just what i expected it's at any rate partly what i expected i said it had already struck me that if well supposing whatever it was that the chinaman dropped into those glasses didn't act quite as soporifically as he intended to and baxter and his companion woke up and found there was a conspiracy a mutiny going on there'd be a fighting she suggested you're not a squeamish girl i answered there'd be bloody murder their lives or the others and i should say that death stalking through that unholy craft just now she made no answer and we stood staring at the black bulk lying motionless on the grey water stood for a time listening i to tell the truth was straining my ears to catch the plash of oars i thought it possible that some of those on board the yawl might take a violent desire to get ashore but the silence continued and now we said no more of setting out on our homeward journey curiosity as to what had happened kept us there whispering the time passed almost before we realized that night was passing we were suddenly aware of a long line of faint yellow light that rose above the far horizon dawn i muttered dawn and then at that moment we both heard something somewhere outside the bar but close to the shore a steam-propelled vessel was tearing along at a breakneck speed end of chapter twenty two Chapter Twenty Three of Ravensdene Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fourth Chinaman. As we stood there watching, the long line of yellow light on the eastern horizon suddenly changed in color, first to a roseate flush, then to a warm crimson. The scenes around us, sky, sea, and land, brightened as if by magic and with equal suddenness there shot round the edge of the southern extremity of the cove outlining itself against the red sky in the distance the long low-lying hulk of a vessel a dark sinister-looking thing which i recognized at once as a torpedo destroyer it was coming along about half a mile outside the bar at a rare turn of speed which would i knew quickly carry it beyond our field of vision and i was wondering whether from its decks the inside of the cove and the yawl lying at anchor there was visible when it suddenly slackened in its headlong career went about seaward and describing the greater part of a circle came slowly in towards the bar nosing about there beyond the line of white surf for all the world like a terrier at the lip of some rat hole up to that moment miss raven and i had kept silence watching this unexpected arrival in our solitude now turning to look at her i saw that the thought which had come into my mind had also occurred to hers do you think that ship is looking for the yawl she asked it's a gunboat or something of that sort isn't it torpedo destroyer latest class too i answered rakish wicked-looking things aren't they and that's just what i too was wondering it's possible some news of the yawl may have got to the ears of the authorities and this thing may have been sent from the nearest base to take a look along the coast perhaps they've spotted the yawl but they can't get over that bar yet the tide's rising fast though she remarked pointing to the shore immediately before us it'll be up to this boat soon i saw that she was right and that presently the boat would be floating we made it fast and retreated further up the beach amongst the overhanging trees and there from beneath the shelter of a group of dwarf oaks looked seaward again the destroyer lay supine outside the bar watching suddenly right behind her far across the grey sea the sun shot up above the horizon her long dark hull cut across his ruddy face 
and we were then able to make out shapes that moved here and there on her deck. There were live men there, but on the yawl we saw no sign of life. Yet even as we looked, life sprang up there again. Once more a shot rang out, followed by two others in sharp succession. And as we stared in that direction, wondering what this new affray could be, we saw a boat shoot out from beneath the bows with a low, crouching figure in it, which was evidently making frantic efforts to get away. Somebody on board the yawl was just as eager to prevent this escape. Three or four shots sounded. Following one of them, the figure in the boat fell forward with a sickening suddenness. "'Got him,' I said involuntarily. "'Poor devil, whoever he is!' "'No!' exclaimed Miss Raven. "'See, he's up again.' The figure was struggling to an erect position. Even at that distance we could make out the effort. But the light of the newly risen sun was so dazzling and confusing that we could not tell if the figure was that of an Englishman or a Chinaman. It was, at any rate, the figure of a tall man. And whoever he was, he managed to rise to his feet and to lift an arm in the direction of the yawl from which he was then some twenty yards away. Two more shots rang out, one from the yawl, another from the boat. It seemed to me that the man in the boat swayed, but a moment later he was again busy at his oars. No further shot came from the yawl, and the boat drew further and further away from it in the direction of a spit of land some three or four hundred yards from where we stood. There were high rocks at the sea end of that spit. The boat disappeared behind them. "'There's one villain loose, at any rate,' I muttered, not too well pleased to think that he was within reach of ourselves. "'I wonder which. But I'm sure he was winged. He fell in a heap, didn't he, at one of those shots? Of course he'll take to the woods, and we've got to get through them.' "'Not yet,' said Miss Raven. "'Look here.' She pointed across the cove and beyond the bar and I saw then that a boat had been put off from the destroyer, and was being pulled at a rapid rate towards the line of surf, which under the deepening tide was now but a thin streak of white. It seemed to me that I could see the glint of arms above the flash of the oars. Anyway, there was a boat's crew of blue jackets there. "'They're going to board her,' I exclaimed. "'I wonder what they'll find.' "'Dead men,' answered Miss Raven quietly. What else? After all that shooting? I should think that man who's just got away was the last. There was a man left on board who fired at him, and at whom he fired back, I pointed. Yes, and who never fired again, she retorted. They must all... Oh! She interrupted herself with a sharp exclamation, and turning back from watching the blue jackets in their boat, I saw that she was staring at the yawl. From its forecastle, a black column of smoke suddenly shot up, followed by a great lick of flame. "'Good heavens!' I exclaimed. "'The yawl's on fire!' I guessed then at what had probably happened. The man who had just disappeared with his boat behind the spit of land further along the cove had in all likelihood been one of the two survivors of the fight which had taken place in the early hours of the morning. He had wished to get away by himself, had set fire to the yawl, and sneaked away in the only boat, exchanging shots with the man left behind, and probably killing him with the last one. And now there was smoke and flame above what was doubtless a shambles. But by that time the boat's crew from the destroyer had crossed the bar and entered the cove, and the vigorously impelled oars were flashing fast in the sheltered waters. The boat disappeared behind the drifting smoke that poured out of the yawl. Presently we saw figures hurrying hither and thither about her deck. "'They may be in time to get the fire under,' I said. "'Better, perhaps, if they let the whole thing burn itself out. It would burn up a lot of villainy.' "'Here are people coming along the beach,' remarked Miss Raven suddenly. "'Look, they must have seen the smoke rising.' I turned in the direction in which she was looking and saw on the strip of land and pebble beneath the woods a group of figures standing at that moment and staring in the direction of the burning ship which had evidently just rounded the extreme point of the cove at its southern confines. There were several figures in the group, 
and two were mounted. Presently these moved forward in our direction at a smart pace. Before they had gone far, I recognized the riders. "'A search party!' I exclaimed. "'Look! That's Mr. Raven in front, and surely that's Lorrimore behind him. They're looking for us.' She gazed at the approaching figures for a moment, shielding her eyes from the already strong glare of the mounting sun, then ran forward along the shingle to meet them. I followed as rapidly as my improvised footwear would permit. By the time I reached them, Mr. Raven and Lorrimore were off their horses, the other members of the party had come up, and my companion, in tribulation, was explaining the situation. I let her talk. She was summing it all up in more concise fashion than I could have done. Her uncle listened with simple, open-mouthed astonishment. Lorrimore, when it came to mention of the Chinese element, with an obvious growing concern that seemed to be not far away from suspicion, he turned to me as Miss Raven finished. "'How many Chinese do you reckon were on board?' he asked. Four, including the last arrival, described as a gentleman, I answered. And two English? he inquired. One Englishman and one Frenchman, said I. My belief is that the Chinese have settled the other two, and then possibly settled themselves among them. There's one man somewhere in these woods. Whether he's a Chinaman we can't say, we couldn't make out. He stared at me wonderingly for a moment, then turned and looked at the yawl. Evidently the Blue Jackets had succeeded in checking the fire. The flame had died down, and the smoke now only hung about in wreaths. We could see figures running actively about the deck. "'There may be men on there that need medical assistance,' said Lorrimore. "'Where's this boat you mentioned, Middlebrook? I'm going off to that vessel. Two of you men pull me across there.' "'I'll go with you,' said I. "'I left my boots in the cabin. I may find them.' and a good deal else. The boat's just along here. The search party was a mixed lot. A couple of local policemen, some gamekeepers, two or three fishermen, one of Mr. Raven's men servants. Two of the fishermen ran the boat into the water. Lorrimore and I sprang in. This is the most extraordinary affair I ever heard of, he said, as he sat down at my side in the stern. Miss Raven says that you actually suspected my man Wing to be on board. Lorrimore, said I, in ten minutes you'll probably see and learn things that you'd never have dreamed of. Whether your man Wing is on board or not, I don't know, but I know that that girl and I have had a marvellous escape from a nest of human devils. I can't say for myself, but has my hair whitened? Your hair hasn't whitened, he said. You were probably safer than you knew, safe enough if Wing was there. Well, I don't know, I retorted. In future, let me avoid the sight of yellow cheeks and slit eyes. I've had enough. But tell me, how did you and your posse come this way? Didn't Mr. Raven get a wire last night? Mr. Raven did get a wire, he replied. But before he got it, he'd become anxious and had sent out some of his menfolk along the moors and cliffs in search of you. One of them, very late in the evening, came across a man who had been cutting wood somewhere hereabouts, and had seen you and Miss Raven passing through the woods near the shore in company with two strangers. Mr. Raven's man returned close on midnight with this news, and the old gentleman was of course thrown into a great state of alarm. He roused the whole community round Ravensdean Court, got me up, and we set out, as you see. But the whole thing's marvellous. I can't help thinking that Wing may have been on board this vessel, and that it was due to him you got away. You've heard nothing of him from London, I suggested. Nothing from anywhere, he replied, which is precisely why I feel sure that when he went there he came in contact with these people, and has been playing some deep game." deep yes said i deep indeed but what game he made no answer we were now close to the yawl and he was staring expectantly at the figures on her deck suddenly two of these detached themselves from the rest turned came to the side looked down on us one was a grimy-faced alert-looking young naval officer very much alive to his job the other not quite so smoke-blackened but eminently businesslike was 
Scarterfield. Good heavens, I muttered, so he's here. Scarterfield, as we pulled up to the side of the yawl, was evidently telling the young officer who we were. He turned from him to us as we prepared to clamber aboard, and addressed us without ceremony, as if we had been parted from him but a few minutes since our last meeting. "'You'd better be prepared for some unpleasant sights, you two, he said. "'This is no place to bring an empty stomach to at this hour of the morning. "'And I fancy you've no liking for horrors, Mr. Biddlebrook.' "'I've had plenty of them during this night, Scarterfield,' said I. "'I was a prisoner on board this vessel from yesterday afternoon until soon after midnight, "'and I've sat on yonder beach listening to a good many things that have gone on since I got away from her.' He stared at me in astonishment for a moment. So did his companion, whose sharp eyes, running me over, settled their glance on my swathed feet. Yes, I said, staring back at him, just so. I was bundled off in such a hurry that I left my boots behind me. They're in the cabin, and if they aren't burned up, I'll be glad of them. I was making a move in that direction, for I saw that the fire, now well under control, had been confined to the forepart of the yawl, but Scarterfield stopped me. He was clearly as puzzled as anxious. Middlebrook, he said earnestly, I don't understand it at all. You say you were on this vessel during the night? Then in God's name who else was on her? Whom did you find here? What men? I left six men on her, I answered. Netherfield Baxter, a Frenchman, a Chinese gentleman, so described, three Chinese as well. The Frenchman and the Chinese gentleman were those fellows we heard of at Hull, Scarterfield, and one, at any rate, of the other three Chinese was Lo Chu Fen, of whom we've also heard. And you got into their hands? How? he asked. Kidnapped, Miss Raven and myself, by Baxter and the Frenchman in those woods, yesterday afternoon, I answered. We came across them by accident, at the place where they just dug up that monastic silver. There it is, man, I continued, pointing to the chests, which still stood where I had last seen them. You've got it at last. He threw an almost careless glance at the chests, shaking his head. I want something beyond that, he muttered. But you say there were six men altogether? Six? I've enumerated them, I replied. Two Europeans, four Chinese. He turned a quick eye on the naval officer. Then one of them's escaped somehow, he exclaimed. There's only five here, and every man Jack is dead. Where's the other? One did escape, said I. I, too, looked at the lieutenant. He got off in a boat just as you and your men were approaching the bar yonder. I thought you'd see him. No, he answered, shaking his head. We didn't see anybody leave. The yawl lay between us and him, most likely. Where did he land? Behind that spit, I replied, pointing to the place. He vanished from where I stood, behind those black rocks. That was just as you crossed the bar. And he can't have gone far away, for he was certainly wounded as he left the yawl. A man fired at him from the bows. He fired back. We heard those shots, said the lieutenant, and we found a chap. Englishman in the bows, dying, when we boarded her. He died just afterwards. They're all dead. The others were dead then. Not a man alive, I exclaimed. Scarterfield cast a glance astern, the glance of a man who draws back the curtain from a set stage. Look for yourselves, he muttered. Too late for any of your work, doctor. But that sixth man... Lorimore and I, giving no heed just then to the detective's questioning about the escaped man, went towards the after part of the deck. Busied with their labours in getting the fire under control, the Blue Jackets had up to then left the dead man where they found them, with one exception. The man whom they had found in the bows had been carried aft and laid near the entrance to the little deck-house. Some hand had thrown a sheet over him. Lorimore lifted it. We looked down. Baxter. That's the fellow we found right forward, said the lieutenant. He's several slighter wounds on him, but he'd been shot through the chest, heart perhaps, just before we boarded her. 
That would be the shot fired by the man in the boat, I suppose. A good marksman. Was this the skipper? Chief spirit, said I. He was lively enough last night. But the rest? They're all over the place, he answered. They must have had a most desperate do of it. The vessel's more like a slaughterhouse than a ship. He was right there, and I was thankful that Miss Raven and I, for whatever reason on the part of the Chinese, had been so unceremoniously set ashore before the fight began. As Lorrimore went about, noting its evidence, I endeavoured to form some idea, more or less accurate, of the events which had led up to it. It seemed to me that either Baxter or the Frenchman, awaking from sleep sooner than the Chinese had expected, had discovered that treachery was afoot and that wholesale shooting had begun on all sides. Most of the slaughter had taken place immediately in front of the hatchway which led to the cabin in which I had seen Baxter and his two principal associates. Some sort of a rough barricade had been hastily set up there. Behind it the Frenchman lay dead with a bullet through his brain. Before it, here and there on the deck, lay three of the Chinese, their leader, still in his gaily coloured sleeping suit, prominent amongst them, Lo Chu Fun a little further away, the third man near the wheel, face downwards. He, like Chu, was a small-made, wiry fellow, and there was blood everywhere. Scarterfield jogged my elbow as I stood staring at these unholy sights. He was keener of look than I had ever seen him. That fourth Chinaman, he said, I must get him dead or alive. The rest's nothing. I want him. End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of ravensdean court by j s fletcher this librivox recording is in the public domain the silk cap i glanced round lorrimore after an inspection of the dead men had walked aside with the lieutenant and was in close conversation with him i too drew the detective away to the side of the yawl scarterfield i said in a whisper I've grounds for believing that the fourth Chinaman is Lorrimore's servant, Wing. The man we saw at Ravensdean Court? Just so, said I, and who went off to London, you remember, to see what he could do in the way of discovering the other Chinaman, Lo Chu Fen. Yes, I remember that, he answered. There is Lo Chu Fen, I said, pointing to one of the silent figures, and I think that Wing not only discovered him, but came aboard this vessel with him as part of a crew which Baxter and his French friend got together at Limehouse or Poplar. As I say, I've grounds for thinking it. Scarterfield looked round, glanced at the shore, and shook his head. I'm all in the dark about some things, he said. I got on the track of this craft, I'll tell you how later, and found she'd come up this coast, and we got the authorities to send this destroyer after her came with her hell for leather i can tell you from harwich but i don't know a lot that i want to know baxter now you're sure that man lying dead there is the baxter we heard of at blyth and traced to hull certain said i listen and i'll give you a brief account of what's happened since yesterday and of what i've learned since then and it will make things clear to you standing there where the beauty of the fresh morning and the charm of sky and sea made a striking contrast to the horror of our immediate surroundings. I told him, as concisely as I could, of how Miss Raven and myself had fallen into the hands of Netherfield Baxter and the Frenchman, of what had happened to me on board, and, at somewhat greater length, of Baxter's story of his own career as it related to his share in the theft of the monastic treasure from the bank at Blyth, his connection with the Elizabeth Robinson, and his knowledge of the brothers Quick. Nor did I forget Baxter's theory about the rubies, and at that Scarterfield obviously pricked his ears. Now, there's something in that, he said, with a regretful glance at the place where Baxter's dead body lay under its sheet. I wish that fellow had been alive to tell more, for he's right about those rubies, quite right. The Quicks had em, two of em. "'You know that?' I exclaimed. 
I'll tell you, he answered. After we parted, I was very busy investigating matters still further in Devonport and in London, and, through the newspapers, of course, I got in touch with the man who told me a lot. He came to headquarters in London asking for me, wouldn't tell any of our people there anything. It was a day or two before I got at close quarters with him, for when he called I was away at the time. He left an address in Hatton Gardens, a Mr. Isidore Baubenheimer, dealer, as you may conclude, in precious stones. Well, I drove off at once to see him. He told me a queer tale. He said that he'd only just come back from Amsterdam and Paris, or he'd have been in communication with me earlier. While he'd been away, he said, he'd read the English newspapers and seen a good deal about the two murders at Saltash and Ravensdean Court, and he believed that he could throw some light on them, for he felt sure that either Noah Quick or Salter Quick was identical with the man with whom he had not so long ago talked over the question of the value of certain stones which the man possessed. But I'll show you Balbenheimer's own words. I got him to make a clear statement of the whole thing, and had it taken down in black and white, and I have a typed copy of it in my pocket-book. Glance over it for yourself." He produced a sheet of paper, folded and endorsed, and handed to me. It ran thus. My place of business in Hatton Garden is a few doors away from the Hatton Garden entrance to the old Mitre Tavern, which lies between that street and Ely Place. On, as far as I can remember, the 7th or 8th of March last, I went into the Mitre about half-past eleven o'clock one morning, expecting to meet a friend of mine who was often there about that time. He hadn't come in. I sat down with a drink and a cigar to wait for him. In the little room where I sat there were three other men. Two of them were men that I knew, men who dealt in diamonds in a smallish way. The other was a stranger, a thick-set, middle-aged, seafaring sort of man, hard-bitten, dressed in a blue serge suit of nautical cut. I could tell from his hands and his general appearance that he'd knocked about the world in his time. Just then he was smoking a cigar and had a tumbler of rum and water before him, and he was watching, with a good deal of interest, the other two, who, close by, were showing each other a quantity of loose diamonds, which evidently, to the seafaring man's amazement, they spread out openly on their palms. After a bit they got up and went out, and the stranger glanced at me. Now I am, as you see, something of the nautical sort myself, bearded and bronzed and all that. I'm continually crossing the North Sea, and it may be he thought I was of his own occupation. Anyway, he looked at me as if wanting to talk. "'I reckon they think nothing of pulling out a fistful of them things hereabouts, mister,' he said. "'No more to them than sovereigns and half-sovereigns and banknotes is to bank clerks.' "'That's about it,' said I. "'You'll see them shown in the open street outside.' "'Trade of this part of London, isn't it?' he asked. "'Just so,' said I. "'I'm in it myself.' He gave me a sharp, inquiring look at that. Ah, he remarked, then you'll be a gentleman as knows the valley of a thing of that sort when you sees it? Well, I think so, I answered. I've been in the trade all my life. Have you got anything to dispose of? I see you're a seafaring man, and I've known sailors who brought something nice home now and then. Same here, said he, but I never known a man as brought anything half as good as what I have. Ah, said I, then you have something? That's what I come into this here neighborhood for this morning, he answered. I have something, and a friend of mine says he to me, Hatton Garden, he says, is the port for you. They eats and drinks and wallers and them sort of things down that way, he says. So I steers for this here, only I don't know no fish, you see, as I could put the question to what I wants to ask. "'Put it to me,' said I, drawing out my card-case. "'There's my card, and you can ask anybody within half a square mile "'if they don't know me for a trustworthy man. "'What is it you've got?' I went on, "'never dreaming that he'd got anything at all of great value. "'I'll give you an idea of its worth in two minutes.' "'But he glanced round at the door and shook his head. "'Not here, mister,' he said. 
i wouldn't let the light o day shine on what i got in a public place like this not nohow but he added i see you have a office and all that i ain't undisposed to go there with you if you like you seem an honest man come on then i said my office is just round the corner and though i've clerks in it will be private enough there right you are mister he answered and he drank off his rum and we went out and round to my office i took him into my private room i had a young lady clerk in there she'd remember this man well enough and he looked at her and then at me send the girl away he muttered there's a matter of undressing d'ye see in getting at what i want to show you i sent her out of the room and sat down at my desk he took off his overcoat his coat and his waistcoat shoved his hand into some secret receptacle that seemed to be hidden in the band of his trousers somewhere behind the small of his back and after some acrobatic contortions and twistings lugged out a sort of canvas parcel the folds of which he unwrapped leisurely and suddenly coming close to me he laid the canvas down on my blotting pad and i found myself staring at some dozen or so of the most magnificent pearls i had ever set eyes on and a couple of rubies which i knew to be priceless i was never more astonished in my life but he was cool as a cucumber what do you think of that lot mister he asked i reckon you don't see a little lot of that quality every day no my friend said i nor every year either nor every ten years where on earth did you get them away east said he and i've had em some time not being particular about selling em but i've settled down in england now and i think i will sell em and buy house property with the money what do you fix their valley at now mister thereabouts anyway good heavens man i said they're worth a great deal of money a great deal i'm very well aware of that mister he answered very well aware indeed nobody better i seen a deal of things in my time and i ain't no fool you really want to sell them i asked if i get the full price said he and that of course would be a big un the thing to do i said would be to find somebody who wants to complete a particularly fine set of pearls some very rich woman who'd stick at nothing the same remark applies to the rubies maybe you could come across some customer he suggested no doubt in a little time i answered well he said i'm going up north i've a bit of business that way and i reckon i'll be back here in london in a week or so i'll call in then mister and if you found anybody that's likely to deal i'll show him the goods with pleasure you'd better leave them with me and let me show them to some possible buyers i said but he was already folding up his canvas wrapping again governor he answered i can see as how you're an honest man and i treats you as such and so will but i couldn't have them things out of my possession for one minute until i sells em i've a brother mister he added as owns half a share in em d'ye see and i holds myself responsible to him but now that you've seen em governor find a buyer or buyers i'll shove my bows round that door of yours again this day week and with that he restored his treasures to their hiding-place assumed his garments once more and remarking that he had trained to catch hastened off again assuring me that he would call in a week on his return from the north i folded up the statement and restored it to scarterfield what do you think of that he asked salter quick without a doubt i answered it corroborates baxter's story of the rubies he didn't mention any pearls and i think now scarterfield that salter quick's murder lies at the door of one of those chinamen who in their turn are lying dead before us well and that's what i think said he though however a chinaman could be about this coast without the local police learning something of it at the time they were inquiring into the murder beats me however there it is i feel sure of it and i was going to tell you i got wind of this you all down limehouse way i found out that she'd been in the thames and that her owner had enlisted a small crew of chinamen and had gone away with them and i found out further that she'd been seen off the norfolk coast going north 
so then i pitched a hot and strong story to the authorities about piracy and all manner of things and they sent this destroyer in search of baxter and me on her if we'd only been twelve hours sooner lorrimore and the lieutenant came up to us my men have the fire completely beaten said the lieutenant glancing at scarterfield if you want to look around we began a thorough examination of the yawl in the endeavour to reconstruct the affair of the early morning for there were all the elements of a strange mystery in that and curiosity about the whole thing was as strong in me as in scarterfield we knew now many things that we had not known twenty-four hours before one was that the many affairs dark and nefarious of netherfield baxter had nothing to do with the murders of noah and salter quick another that those murders without doubt arose from the brothers possession of the pearls and rubies which salter had shown to the hatton garden diamond merchant all things considered it seemed to me that the explanation of the mystery rested in some such theory as this the chinaman lo chu fen doubtless knew as well as baxter and his french friend that the quicks were in possession of the rubies stolen from the heathen temple in southern china no doubt he had become acquainted with that fact when the marooned party from the elizabeth robinson were on the intimate terms of men united by a common fate on the lonely island drifting eventually to england chu had probably discovered the whereabouts of the two brothers had somehow found that the rubies were still in their possession might possibly have been in personal touch with salter or with noah had taken others of his compatriots discovered in the chinese quarters of the east end into his confidence and engineered a secret conspiracy for securing the valuables he himself had probably tracked salter to the lonely bit of shore near ravensdean court associates of his had no doubt fallen upon noah at saltash but how had all this led up to the attack of the chinese on baxter and the frenchman and who was the man who leaving every other member of the yawl's company dead or dying and who had exchanged those last shots with netherfield baxter had escaped to the shore and was now no doubt endeavouring to make a final bid for liberty reckoning up everything we saw it seemed to me from my knowledge of the preceding incidents that the drug which the chinese gentleman as baxter had been pleased to style him had not had the effects that he desired and anticipated and that one or the other of the two men to whom it had been administered had been aroused from sleep before any attack could be made on both i figured things in this way baxter or the frenchman or both had awakened and missed the chinaman one or both had turned out to seek him had discovered that miss raven and i were missing had scented danger to themselves found the chinese up to some game and opened fire on them evidently the first fighting as i had gathered from the revolver shots had been sharp and decisive i formed the conclusion that when it was over there were only two men left alive of whom one was baxter and the other the man whom we had seen escaping in the boat baxter i believed had put up some sort of barricade and watched his enemy from it that he himself was already seriously wounded i gathered from two facts one that his body had several superficial wounds on arms and shoulders and that in the cabin behind the hastily constructed barricade sheets had been torn into strips for bandages which we found on these wounds where as far as he could he had roughly twisted them then according to my thinking he had eventually seen the other survivor who was probably in like case with himself as regards superficial wounds endeavouring to make off and emerging from his shelter had fired on him from the side of the yawl only to be killed himself by return fire there was no mistaking the effect of that last shot chance shot or well-directed aim it had done for netherfield baxter and he had crumpled up and died where he dropped a significant exclamation from scarterfield called me to his side he aided by one of the blue jackets was examining the body of lo chu fen look here he murmured as i went up to him this chap has been searched after he was dead i mean there's a body belt that he wore 
it's been violently torn from him his clothing ripped to get at it and the belt itself hacked to pieces in the endeavour to find something whose work has that been the work of the man who got away in the boat said i of course he's been after those rubies and pearls scarterfield we must be after him he said you say you think he was wounded in getting away he was certainly wounded i affirmed i saw him fall headlong in the boat after the first shot he recovered himself fired the shot which no doubt finished baxter and must have been wounded again for the two men again fired simultaneously and the man in the boat swayed at that second shot but once more he pulled himself together and rowed away well if he's wounded he can't get far without attracting notice declared scarterfield we'll organize a search for him presently but first let's have a look into the quarters that these chinamen occupied the smoke of the fire which seemed to have broken out in the forecastle and had been confined to it by the efforts of the sailors from the destroyer had now almost cleared away and we went forward to the galley the fire had not spread to that and after the scenes of blood and violence astern and in the cabin the place looked refreshingly spick and span there was indeed an unusual air of neatness and cleanliness about it the various pots and pans shone gaily in the sun's glittering lights every utensil was in its place evidently the galley's controlling spirit had been a meticulously careful person who hated disorder as heartily as dirt and on a shelf near the stove was laid out what i took to be the things which the vanished cook whoever he might be had destined for breakfast a tempting one of kidneys and bacon soles eggs a curry i gathered from this and pointed my conclusion out to scarterfield that the presiding genius of the galley had had no idea of the mutiny into which he had been plunged soon after midnight ay said scarterfield just so i see your point and you think that man of lorimer's wing was aboard and if so he's the man who escaped i've strong suspicions said i yet they were based on a plum cake well and i've known of worse clues he rejoined but i wonder now if only we knew just then lorimore came along poking his head into the galley he suddenly uttered a sharp exclamation and reached an arm to a black silk cap which hung from a peg on the boarding above that's wings he said in emphatic tones i saw him make that cap himself end of chapter twenty four Chapter Twenty Five of Ravensdene Court by J. S. Fletcher. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Clear decks. The bit of headgear which Lorimore had taken down assumed a new interest. Scarterfield and I gazed at it as if it might speak to us. Nevertheless, the detective, when he presently spoke, showed some incredulity. That's the sort of cap that any Chinaman wears, he remarked it may have belonged to any of them no answered lorrimore with emphatic assurance that's my man's i saw him making it he's as deft with his fingers at that sort of thing as he is at cooking and since this cap is his and as he's not among the lot there on deck he's the man that you middlebrook saw escaping in the boat and since he is that man i know where he'd be making where then demanded scarterfield to my house answered lorrimore scarterfield showed more doubt i don't think that's likely doctor he said presumably he's got those jewels on him and i should say he'd get away from this with the notion of trusting to his own craft to get unobserved on a train and lose himself in newcastle a chinaman with valuables on him worth eighty thousand pounds come you don't know that he's any valuables of any sort on him retorted lorrimore that's all supposition i say that if my man wing was on this vessel as i'm sure he was he was on it for purposes of his own he might be with this felonious lot but he wouldn't be of them i know him and i'm off to get on his track lay you anything you like a thousand to one that i find wing at my house 
"'I'm not taking you, Lorrimore,' said I. "'I don't mind laying the same.' Scarterfield looked curiously at the two of us. Apparently his belief in Chinese virtue was not great. "'Well,' he said, "'I'm on his track anyhow, and I propose to get away to the beach. There's nothing more we can do here. These naval people have got this job in charge now. Let's leave them to it. Yet, he added, as we left the galley, and with a significant glance at me, there is one thing, Middlebrook. Wouldn't you like to have a look inside those two chests that we've heard so much about, you and I? I certainly should, I answered. Then we will, he said. I, too, have some curiosity that way. And if Master Wing has repaired to the doctor's house, he's all right, and if he hasn't, he can't get very far away, being a Chinaman in his native garments and wounded. The chests which had come aboard the yawl with Miss Raven and myself the previous afternoon, it seemed as if ages had gone by since then, still stood where they had been placed at the time, close to the gangway leading to the main cabin. Lorrimore, Scarterfield, the young naval officer, and I gathered round, while a couple of handy blue jackets forced them open. No easy business, for whether the dishonest bank manager and Netherfield Baxter had ever opened them or not, they were screwed up again in a fashion which showed business-like resolves that they should not be easily opened again. But at last the lids were off, to reveal inner shells of lead and within these, gleaming dully in the fresh sunlight, lay the monastic treasures of which Scarterfield and I had read in the hotel at Blyth. Queer, said the detective, as he stood staring meditatively at patterns and chalices, reliquaries and pyxes. All these, I reckon, are sacred things, consecrated and all that, and yet ever since the Reformation time they've been mixed up with robbery, and now at last with wholesale murder. Odd, isn't it? However, there they are. And here, he added, pulling the parchment schedules out of his pocket, which he had discovered at Baxter's old lodgings in Blyth, and handing them to the lieutenant, here is the list of what ought to be. You'll take all this in charge, of course. I don't know if it comes within the law of treasure trove or not, but as the original owners are dust and ashes four hundred years ago, I should say it does. Anyway, the Crown solicitors will soon settle that point. We went off from the yawl, the three of us, in the boat which had brought Lorrimore and me aboard her. The group on shore saw us making for the point whereat the escaping figure had landed in the early morning, and followed us thither along the beach. They came up to us as we stepped ashore, and while Lorrimore began giving Mr. Raven an account of what we had found on the yawl, I drew his niece aside. "'You had better know the worst in a word,' I said. "'We were more than fortunate in getting away from the yawl as we did. Don't be upset. There isn't a man alive on that thing.' "'Baxter?' she exclaimed. "'I said, not one,' I answered. "'Wholesale. Don't think about it. As for me, I wish I'd never seen it but now it's a question of a living man, Wing. Then it was as I thought, she asked, Wing was there? Lorrimore is sure of it. He found a cap of Wings in the galley, said I, and as Wing isn't amongst the dead, he's the man who escaped. Scarterfield came up, the local policeman with him who had joined Mr. Raven's search party as it came across country. "'Whereabouts did this man land, Middlebrook?' he asked. "'You saw him, you and Miss Raven, didn't you?' "'We saw him round these rocks,' I replied. "'But then they hid him from us. We couldn't see exactly. Somewhere on the other side of them, anyway.' We spread ourselves out along the shore, crossing the spit of sand, now encroached on considerably by the tide, and began to search amongst the black rocks that jutted out of it thereabouts. Presently we came across the boat, slightly rocking in the lapping water alongside a ledge. I took a hasty glance into it and drew Miss Raven away, for on the thwarts and on the seat in the stern and on one of the oars thrown carelessly aside there was blood. A sharp cry from one of the men who had gone a little ahead brought us all hurrying to his side. 
he had found amongst the rocks a sort of pool at the sides of which there was dry sand-strewn rock there were marks there as if a man had knelt in the sand and there was more blood and there were strips of clothing linen silk as if the man had torn up some of his garments as temporary bandages he's been here said lorrimore in a low voice probably washed his wounds here salt as a styptic flesh wounds most likely but he added sinking his voice still lower judging from what we've seen of the blood he's lost he must have been weakening by the time he got here still he's a man of vast strength and physique and he'd push on look for marks of his footsteps we eventually picked up a recently made track in the sand and followed it until it came to a point at the end of the overhanging woods where they merged into the open moorland running steeply down towards the beach there in the short wiry grass of the close-knitted turf the marks vanished just as i said muttered lorrimore whom with miss raven and myself was striding on a little in advance of the rest he's made for my place as i knew he would i knew enough of this country to know that there's a road at the head of these moors that runs parallel with the railway on one side and the coast on the other towards ravensdean he'd be making for that he'd take up the side of this wood as the nearest way to strike the road that he was right in this we were not long in finding out twice as our party climbed the steep side of the moorland we came across evidence of the fugitive at two points we found places whereat a man had recently sat down on the bank beneath the trees to rest and at one of them we found more a blood-soaked bandage no man can go far losing blood in that way whispered lorrimore to me as we went onward he can't be far off and suddenly we came across our quarry coming out on the top of the moorland and rounding the corner of the woods we hit the road of which lorrimore had spoken a long white hedgeless wallless ribbon of track that ran north and south through treeless country there a few yards away from us stood an isolated cottage some gamekeeper's or watcher's place with a bit of unfenced garden before it in that garden was a strange group gathered about something that at first we did not see mr cazalette obviously very busy the police inspector a horse and trap tethered to a post close by showed how they had come a woman evidently the mistress of the cottage a child open-mouthed wide-eyed with astonishment at these strange happenings a dog that moved uneasily around the two-legged folk whimpering his concern the bystanders moved as we hurried up and then we caught glimpses of towels and water and hastily improvised bandages and smelt brandy and saw in the midst of all this wing propped up against a bank of earth his eyes closed and over his yellow face a queer grey-white pallor his left arm and shoulder were bare save for the bandages which cazalet was applying there were discarded ones on the turf which was soaked with blood lorrimore darted forward with a hasty exclamation and had cazalet's job out of the old gentleman's hands and into his own before the rest of us could speak he motioned the whole of us away except cazalet and the woman and the police inspector turned to mr raven and his niece and to myself and scarterfield i think we were just about in time he said laconically i don't know what it all means but i reckon the man was about done for bleeding to death i should say you found him i asked no he answered not at first anyway the woman there says she was out here in her garden feeding her fowls when she saw him stagger round the corner of the wood there and make for her he fell across the bank where he's lying in a dead faint and she ran for water just then we came along in the trap saw what was happening and jumped out fortunately when we set off mr cazalet insisted on bringing a big flask of neat brandy and some food he said you never knew what you mightn't want and we gave him a stiff dose and pulled him round sufficiently to be able to tell us where he was wounded and he's got a skinful 
a bullet through the thick part of his left arm, another at the point of the same shoulder, and a third just underneath it. Mr. Cazalet says they're all flesh wounds, but I don't know. I know the man's fainted twice since we got to him. And look here, just before he fainted the last time, he managed to fumble amongst his clothing with his right hand, and he pulled something out and shoved it into my hand with a word or two. "'Give it to Lorrimore,' he said in a very weak voice. "'Tell him I found it all out, and was going to trap all of them, but they were too quick for me last night. All dead now.' Then he fainted again, and look at this. He drew out a piece of canvas, twisted up anyhow, and opening it before our wondering eyes, revealed a heap of magnificent pearls and a couple of wonderful rubies that shone in the sunlight like fire. "'That's what he gave me,' said the inspector. "'What is it? What's it mean?' "'That's what Salter Quick was murdered for,' said I, "'and it means that Lorrimore's man ran down the murderer.' And without waiting for any comment from him, and leaving Scarterfield to explain matters, I went across the little garden to see how the honest Chinaman was faring. It was a strange, yet a plain story, that Wing told his master, and a select few of us a day or two later, when Lorrimore had patched him up. To anybody of a humdrum life, such as mine had always been until these events, it was indeed a stirring story. The queer thing, however, at any rate queer to me, was that the narrator, as calm and suave as ever in his telling of it, did not seem to regard it as anything strange at all. He might have been explaining to us some new way of making a good cake. At our request and suggestion, he had journeyed to London and plunged into those quarters of the East End wherein his fellow countrymen are to be found. His knowledge of the district of which Limehouse Causeway forms a centre soon brought him in touch with Lo Chu Fan, who, as he quickly discovered, had remained in London during the last two or three years, assisting in the management of a Chinese eating house. Close by, in a lodging kept by a compatriot, Wing put himself up and cultivated Chu's acquaintance. Ere many days had passed, another Chinaman came on the scene. This was the man whom Baxter had described as a Chinese gentleman. He represented himself to Wing and Chu as a countryman of theirs, who had been engaged in highly successful trading operations in Europe, and was now, in company with two friends, an Englishman and a Frenchman, carrying out another which involved a trip in a small but well-appointed yacht across the Atlantic. He wanted these countrymen of his own to make up a crew. An introduction to Baxter and the Frenchman followed, and Wing and Chu were taken into confidence as regards the treasure hidden on the Northumberland coast. A share of the proceeds was promised them. They secured a third trustworthy Chinaman in the person of one Ah Wong, an associate of Chu's, and the yawl, duly equipped, left the Thames and went northward. By this time Wing had wormed himself completely into Chu's confidence, and without even discovering whether Chu was or was not the actual murderer of Salter Quick. He believed him to be, and believed Wong to be the murderer of Noah at Saltash. He had found out that Chu was in possession of the pearls and rubies which, though Wing had no knowledge of that, Salter had exhibited to Baubenheimer. And as the yawl neared the scene of the next operations, Wing made his own plans. He had found out that its owners, after recovering the monastic treasurers, were going to call at Leith, where they were to be met by the private yacht of some American whose name Wing never heard. Accordingly, he made up his mind to escape from the yawl as soon as it got into Leith, to go straight to the police, and there give information as to the doings of the men he was with. But here his plans were frustrated. He was taken aback by the capture of Miss Raven and myself, by Baxter and the Frenchman, and though he contrived to keep out of our way, he was greatly concerned lest we should see him and conclude that he had joined the gang and was privy to its past and present doings. But that very night a much more serious development materialized. The Chinese gentleman, arriving from London and being met by the Frenchman at Berwick, had a scheme of his own which, 
after he had attempted the drugging of his two principal associates, he unfolded to his fellow countrymen. This was to get rid of Baxter and the Frenchman, and seize the yawl and its contents for themselves, sailing with it to some port in North Russia. Wing had no option but to profess agreement. His only proviso was that Miss Raven and myself should be cleared out of the yawl. This proposition was readily assented to, and Chu was charged with the job of sending us ashore. But almost immediately afterwards, everything went wrong with the conspirators' plans. The drug which had been administered to Baxter and the Frenchman failed to act. Baxter, waking suddenly to find the Chinaman advancing on the cabin with only too evident murderous intent, opened fire on them, and the situation rapidly resolved itself into a free fight in the course of which Wing barricaded himself into the galley. Before long he saw that of all the men on board only himself and Baxter remained alive. He saw, too, that Baxter was already wounded. Baxter, evidently afraid of Wing, also barricaded himself into the cabin. For some hours the two secretly awaited each other's onslaught. At last Wing determined to make a bid for liberty, and cautiously worming his way to the cabin, he looked in, and, as he thought, saw Baxter lying either dead or dying. He then hastily stripped Chu of the belt, in which he knew him to carry the precious stones, and, taking to the boat which lay at the side of the yawl, pushed off, only to find Baxter after him with a revolver. In the exchange of shots which followed, Wing was hit twice, but a lucky reply of his laid Baxter dead. At that he got away, weak and fainting, managed to make the shore, to bind up as much of his wounded body as he could get at, and set out as well as he was able for his master's house. The rest we knew. So that was all over, and it only remained now for the police to clear things up, for Wing to be thoroughly whitewashed in the matter of the shooting of Netherfield Baxter, and for everybody in the countryside to talk of the affair for nine days, and perhaps a little more. Mr. Cazalette talked a great deal. As for Miss Raven and myself, as actors in the last act of the drama which ended in such a tragedy, we talked little. We had seen too much at close quarters. But on the first occasion on which she and I were alone again, I made a confession to her. "'I don't want you, of all people, to get any mistaken impression about me,' I said. "'So I'm going to tell you something. During the whole of the time that you and I were on that yawl, I was in an absolute panic of fear.' "'You were?' she exclaimed. "'Really frightened?' "'Quaking with fright,' I declared boldly. "'Especially after you'd retired. I literally sweated with fear.' There, now it's out. She looked at me not at all unkindly. Mm, she said at last. Then all I have to say is that you concealed it admirably, when I was about at any rate. And, here she sunk her voice to a pleasing whisper, I'm sure that if you were frightened, it was entirely on my account. So? In that way we began a courtship, which proving highly satisfactory on both sides is now about to come to an end or a new beginning in marriage end of chapter twenty five recording by nicholas clifford middlebury vermont u s a end of ravensdean court by j s fletcher